We're just about to get underway, so please do find a seat. Make yourselves comfortable for our final day. I think everybody is just walking into the room. I also want to give a very warm welcome to all who are joining us online here for Alt Annual Conference. And today is our hybrid day where we start in person and online. And then at lunchtime, we move to a fully online program and after party. Now, as you know, we've been really having fantastic support from all of our partners, exhibitors, and sponsors throughout this event and in a run-up to it. And I just want to appreciate that support once again. We're really grateful to have so many organizations who are involved in ALT, not just for ALT-C, but through the whole year. And today, our call to get involved in ALT opens. So if you've been inspired to maybe re-engage or engage more or find out a little bit more about how you can get involved in our activities and our governance, then please have a look out for the thank you email that will be sent to all delegates at the end of today and think about if there's any opportunities that are a good fit for you. Now, this afternoon or evening um, from 6 p.m. our time here in the UK, um, we're going to head to the airwaves to celebrate in traditional style now over the past few years with the Thursday night radio show. And I'm really grateful for all the members who voluntarily put on this after party. You can keep chatting on Discord and on the social media using our hashtag AltC22. So hopefully I'll see many of you there. You can join from the train and listen to the beats of the community. And now, I know you've met Joe um, already throughout this conference, and WeVox have done a fantastic job supporting community engagement and audience engagement throughout this event. But there is a whole team here, and so I thought for the last day today, we get them all up on stage. So please give a very warm welcome to the whole team this morning. Uh, thank you very much, and um, yeah, I hope you guys are looking forward to um, yeah today. Thank you to um, ALT for having um, us uh, here for another year. Um, as the slide implies, you know we've been working with you guys for half a decade, um, and it really is a, um, a highlight of the year for us um, to join you guys for this um, for this event. Um, we are still down in the um, exhibition area, so do you come and say hello? Um, not now, because we're all up here. Um, but, but yeah, any other time, do come and say um, hello to us. So we will be using VVOTS again in this, um, in this session and online, um, so you can join uh, VVOX, use it for, for Q&A in the sessions, but we're also going to use it again this morning um, for a word cloud. So um, join instructions are up on all the screens, scan the QR code or open up a web browser, go to vvox.app um, and enter in that session ID. Um, cool, okay, so let's launch that word cloud if that's, uh, if that's okay. So what we wanted to ask you guys uh, this morning is what are your main takeaways from Alt-C22? So we give you guys a bit of time to join that session and start entering in some responses. That's a nice one to get started. More gaming. Friends, community still going strong, that's fantastic. So yeah, join the instructions are on the side, so if you still haven't uh, connected to the session, you can just scan that QR code. Um, and as I say, we'll be using VBOX uh, throughout the sessions for asking questions as well, so it's uh, worth getting onto that. Community coming in nice and big there. I like sore feet, so that's safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stairs to get, uh, get up to the top every, every day. Fantastic. Um, awesome. That's really cool. Um, let's leave that open just a little bit, a uh, little bit longer. Um, well, what you'll also find on all the seats um, is both joining instructions for 
um, uh, the, the VBOT session. So if you um, need those, they're on there. But on the flip side of that as well, we've got a um, got the crossword that you can complete. So do feel free to uh, to do that. It's just a bit of fun. Um, bring any completed crosswords to our stands, and um, yeah, you, we can uh, we can sort you guys out with a uh, uh, with a prize. And for the guys online, do. Do feel free to join in, take a picture of the completed crossword and uh, email us um, at uh, education at vbox.com and we'll be very happy to send you a prize in the post as well. Um, so just to get you started with that, if you haven't um, been doing the crossword in the, the first two days, um, I'll just give you a clue for uh, free down. So the clue is that this actor has starred in the title role in uh, Doctor Strange. Um, and that's it. As I say, do come and say hello to us. Um, we're just down in the exhibition area on uh, Stand 12. And yeah, really great to be with you guys for another year. It is definitely a day to appreciate some of the hard work that's going on behind the scenes. And as this is the last time we're all in one room together, on behalf of all involved, I just want to give a big thank you to my staff team who've done a sterling job together with our conference helpers and our online helpers who are moderating sessions throughout the day today as well, working with the venue staff, our program committee and our whole board of trustees. So there is a lot of people making this conference happen. And some of the people we want to celebrate most at this conference are the ones who are being recognized this year um, and we have some of the winners of this year's awards with us this morning. So first up on stage is going to be Dave White, who will lead this session. So please put your hands together and welcome our speakers for this morning. Morning. Okay, so this is a little known thing, but as president of all, I can officially, what would it be? bequeath onto you guys a gift for being here at the first session uh, of the last day, which is a very particular thing. Now the gift is that you can, you can officially know in your heart that you are the best delegates at all. Okay? <laughs> You're not allowed to tell anybody else, but I officially bequeath that on you now. Thank you for coming this morning. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, bring up on stage some of the winners, as Marion mentioned, and we're going to hear a little bit more from them about the work that they were involved in that led to them getting the award. Um, these are the awards. I mean, I, I expect most of you were, because if you're the kind of people that turn up first thing on the last day, then I'm guessing most of you were here for the awards as well. So you'll already know this, but these are the awards. And as I say, some, some of them are new. Some of them are kind of classic old awards. Um, and I think we're going to run through today in, in, in that order, okay? So first up is going to be the award for individuals, which was uh, won by Wayne. Where's Wayne? If you'd like to come up. So Wayne, you're just gonna take us through uh, sort of a specific aspect or some of the, yeah. some of the details of, of, of that work, because obviously it's a bit difficult to get into on the awards night, so it'd be interesting yeah. to hear from you on that. So Things, I'm gonna- uh, audio for the first slide. Minutes. Uh, thanks, David, and uh, thanks to everybody uh, at all. I've really enjoyed it. It's my first time at the conference, and having won a prize, I think I might retire now. Um, so I've got 10 minutes um, to give you just a very quick overview. Now, I can't give a four-year research paper uh, in, in 10 minutes, but I'm going to try to just highlight a few things. So um, what I'm going to see on the next slide is uh, the set of badges that was designed for a pilot study. Now, somebody asked me yesterday about graphic design. I'm not a graphic designer, but I came up with these pictures quite quickly myself. Um, there's a lot of them there. I wouldn't recommend anybody doing a badging scheme to try and recreate 17 or 18 badges. Start small, start with one or two. Um, but there were a range of them available. Across the middle in the hexagons, there were ones related to assessment. They're probably the easiest ones to come up with. If somebody gets over 80%, you give them a higher achiever award. They weren't terribly valuable. People, the students didn't really go for those, but they're an easy one to create. Across the top then, on the right-hand side, we had best in class. So for some key milestone assessments, there was one badge given to the best grade. Uh, on the top left, the triangular ones, we have the leveling up. 
Now, I invented those before Boris. That's not, that, that phrase predates Boris is leveling up. I'll explain what that one is in a bit more detail in a minute because it's probably one of the best ones. Uh, and across the bottom and the left, peer nominated badges, and the ones in the bottom right, mystery badges. Because even when I was creating this, I thought, hang on, what if something comes up during the year that I haven't thought about? So I created mystery badges. The students didn't know what they were. I didn't even know what they were going to be. And that's where the intrigue came in. The students said, I decided to come to class today because maybe there was going to be a badge given out and I didn't want to miss it. Now that's, that's brilliant. So um, I'm just going to focus in on three of those types of badges that I, that I would always say to people, these are the ones you should go for. So on the next slide, you see that the uh, attendance badge. This was one of the mystery badges. I'm not going to read it, and I wouldn't expect you to read it all there. But just to get a sense of the level of detail that's in there, it clearly describes what the student had to do to attain that badge. And it also gives a little bit of, um, I suppose, background to why this is important. If a student is attending 100%, it tells you something about their behavior and their attitude to classes. So a number of students got that one, and they reported coming to class because they knew they were going to get it at the end of the year. Um, just to give you, uh, on the next slide, actually, thanks. Uh, some of the responses to that, you can see there what the institute manager, sa manager said. And what she focused in on was the fact that um, attending students, there's a, there's a difference between students who attend and who are good. The good students might actually disengage and not attend because they think they're going to pass anyway. But the badge made those people come in and they were then able to help their classmates. Uh, so on the next slide, this is the levelling up one. Now again, there's quite a level of detail in this, and I was talking to, to um, somebody yesterday about this. You do have to spend some time writing this, because it's a bit like a learning outcome. You get one shot at it, really. So this took me longer than the graphical part. On this one, to earn this badge, a student had to re-attempt an assessment. So essentially, really, what happened was, if a student felt they had a bad day at the office, they did an assessment, and they felt, you know what, I, I could have done better there, they were allowed to have a second attempt. They sent their second attempt to me, I marked it, and if it was better than their first attempt, they got the levelling up badge. The grade stood from their first attempt, because that was done in an exam situation, but they got this badge to recognise skills mastery. And that came up at a workshop I was at yesterday evening uh, about skills mastery. This is skills mastery in action. This is a student volunteering to have a second attempt to prove to themselves that they can do better. So on the next slide, there's some reaction to that. This is what the employer said. Excuse the, excuse the gender bias uh, that, that his words have in here. Um, but the employer basically said, that's the person I want working for me. Somebody who's not going to turn their laptop off at 5 o'clock on a Friday evening. Who's going to go and make sure that they act on lessons learned, even though they don't have a great reward for it. The employer wasn't interested in the best person in the class in terms of grades that was the person that they were interested in. Uh, another reaction to that slide, or to that uh, badge type. Oh, sorry, there's only one reaction to that one. This is the third badge type. So we've had attendance, we've had leveling up, and then we've had the buddy badges. Now, the buddy badges were, were available to students by peer nomination. So they were able to say, I was helped by a classmate, and I'd like to give that classmate something back. So the students were issuing these badges to themselves by nomination. Again, a huge amount of detail went into the text behind that, but it's, it's important to do that because these are the type of badges that if an employer clicks on it, they click on the image and up comes the text, the employer needs to know what that badge really means. And I had a conversation with somebody yesterday about grades and what does 72% mean? I don't really know. Does that, is it that much better than 70? Is it that much worse than 80? So if you can give descriptions like this to a potential employer, they know exactly what that badge means. There's no gray area about what it means. So that's why there's so much text in that. Somebody's going to be reading that to get an idea of what this candidate is really like. So some reactions to that badge on the next slide. Again, this is from the Institute Manager. Um, and what she's talking about here is engagement uh, within peer groups. And she values that maybe even more than just purely attendance. And you can see here that what she's saying is that as soon as you put students into groups and get them to respond to their peers, all of a sudden they're re-engaged. So this peer learning, we all know about peer learning and the benefits of it. Another reaction to that on the next slide, maybe the most important of all, this is what the student said. Now there's a, th th this is, uh, you know, 
borderline learning styles here, and we, we know about that. But this is what the student was saying, that if, if he can show a classmate in a way that they'd understand the concept, they'd be able to use that information to go on and help somebody else. I mean, isn't that just fantastic? That's what you want students to be able to do. So the badge available for encouraging students to take on that kind of activity uh, was the reward for doing this. But again, there's, there's intrinsic motivation here because the student is doing it so that another student can help somebody else. He or she is not just doing it to get the badge, they're doing it for a general kind of uh, benefit of the class. Uh, I think there might be one more. No, that's it. I was told to stick to 10 minutes. How am I doing? Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Well, then there's a bit more. <laughs> uh, yeah, if anybody wants to talk to me about badges, absolutely, I'm open to all kinds of chat and discussions about it. So if you want to take a snap of that, um, you can reach me in a few different ways. And uh, I'd be delighted to help people on their journey because it's like, as you see there, none of these were about grades or assessments. They were about characteristics of students. And I think it's important that uh, something like a doctoral study has a human impact. Not, you know, there are graphs and there are statistics that go behind this if you're interested in that too, but it's more about the human impact. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. There's been actually a, quite a lot of chat on the on Vbox oh. while you've been because so obviously a lot of interest, including I wonder if there'll be more quiche at lunch. I think yes, <laughs> but I don't know for sure. Um, one of one of so there's some really interesting stuff around the difference between attendance and engagement, and I think. That it, I think you've kind of cracked the difference there and, I, I, and it's interesting hearing what you're saying about employers, potential employers understanding the difference as well. Mm. Uh, the, somebody said, did some of these encourage an unhealthy work-life balance? Because what you're doing is you're sort of, you've sort of got... For the, me? Not for you. <laughs> you've obviously got an unhealthy work-life yeah. balance. That's fine. <laughs> is, is because you've got the course as written and then you've got the badges on top of that. It seems to me you quite successfully created a culture where the students were kind of going the extra mile. Did some of them go the extra, extra, extra mile? Did some of them get obsessed? That's a, that's a fantastic question, yeah. Um, no, I would say the students that went the extra, extra, extra mile were going to do that anyway. And this just happened to be a vehicle for them. Uh, you know, you're always going to get a gradation of students in a class of maybe 40 where you get people who are just, they're high achievers no matter what you do for them no matter what you put in place for them so this was just a way for them to maybe Beat their obsession yeah I think so yeah <laughs> yeah and, and and the flip of that is also true there were some students who just weren't interested in it. yeah 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 well I mean and that relates to the last question that I'll ask you which I think I think you've kind of demonstrated this but there's, there's a comment here about you know how do you how do you work with I mean it doesn't really matter whether they're digital or not how do you work with badges as a concept in a way where students understand the value of them as being more than tokens. Now, I suspect the, the way you've managed that is the, is the level of detail so that the employers could engage with them. But, I mean, I don't know. how Because I yeah. feel like you've, gone, you've managed to use badges in a way that goes past pure tokenism. Just wonder what your thoughts were on that. As a yeah, I, I think badges as pure tokenism, you're wasting everybody's time. There has to be a value, an intrinsic value in them for the students. And I think the real selling point for this was that from the very beginning of the design of the, the scheme, there was an employer involved. Okay. And I think yeah. that was what really kind of the students knew. And one of the mystery badges that came out of it was in the middle of the whole thing. The employer said to me, how's it all going, what way are we fixed, and, and who, are, who are getting these peer nominations? He was really fixated on the peer nominations, and he said, the whoever gets the most peer nominations, yeah. will be, will, will, can we create a new badge for them? And it became, it became the best mentor in class badge. Okay. Now, the students didn't know about that, uh, so there was no gaming of the system to try and get more nominations. This was a complete surprise to them. But the employer latched onto that, and he said, this is, this is what we need, not the person who gets 90% at yeah, the end of the table. Yeah, exam. I mean, I wonder, I wonder how this would work if there wasn't an employer. Anyway, now I'm just, think, now I'm just thinking about it. So I'm supposed to be chairing the session, I'm just well, thinking about it. Well, it's not, so, it's not even, so just to cut across, I'm sorry, yeah. for, no, it's not even an employer. It's even, these are first-year students. So it's even first-year students going back to their parents at Christmas, going, look, look what I got. Okay. You know, because a parent won't know what 45% means. <laughs> but if a parent reads the badge, they go, okay, th my son or daughter is, they're obviously doing something good. So it's not just, I wouldn't get fixated on the employer. 
there's all kinds of other factors. I got fixated there. on the employer. All right. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. Brilliant. Uh, round of applause for Wayne, please. Thank you. Okay. So there's now an ongoing discussion about sausage rolls and quiche. I think we should keep that going. If anybody wants to add another food stuff into that, that's just, you know, that can be part of the session. That's like the food based back channel. Uh, I quite like the, what, which, what did I quite like? Yeah, I think I'm with the sausage rolls. I'm on the sausage rolls side of that debate. Okay, so up next, that was an aside, uh, the award for leadership in digital education. So Anne-Marie, Anne obviously uh, based in Canada, seems only fair that she didn't <laughs> come over. Um, so we've got a little video from her, which is a different video from the one on the awards night. Is that right? Yeah, okay. So we'll watch that. Hello, I'm Anne-Marie Scott. I'm the Deputy Provost at Athabasca University in Canada. And for those of you that don't know Athabasca, we're Canada's fifth largest university and could be considered the equivalent of the UK Open University. I'm recording this today from to Kamloops to Shikwepam within the unceded and traditional lands of Shikwepamulu. And you may have heard of this place as Kamloops, British Columbia. I'm an uninvited settler here and I want to acknowledge how grateful I am for the care that this land has extended to me during what have been some very strange times. I'm also delighted to have been nominated for the inaugural Alt Leadership in Digital Education Award because I'm a learning technologist who's a senior leader in a fully online institution and I strongly believe that we need senior leadership who are well equipped to make the kinds of decisions now required as our institutions and our world become even more digitally infused. I've got a number of roles beyond my job here at Athabasca as board chair of the Aperio Foundation, as a member of the After Surveillance Network, and as a member of the leadership team of the Open ETC here in BC. This work has given me a real breadth of experience and knowledge, and there are lessons that can be learned from many of the initiatives that I've led. And I've tried to make that possible by sharing as much of my work as I can openly via my blog, as well as via presentations and publications. All of my work has been grounded in context, in purpose and in values. I'm very enthusiastic about EdTech. It can be enormous amounts of fun, but I'm also appropriately skeptical and critical. And I think this is vitally important. Work that I've done in the area of policy has directly contributed to the development of Alt's felt framework. My practice and activities have embraced the spirit and ethos of educational ed tech for many years. And I advocate for learning technologists to play a bigger role in our institutions, to bring our critical lens to areas like procurement of ed tech, as well as the support of learning and teaching. Leadership here in a, in a fully digital university like Athabasca also means thinking beyond ed tech though. Over the pandemic, I helped to establish an emergency bursary scheme, secured over half a million dollars in funds for it, and established crisis mental health supports for our students. Because our students can't learn using digital technology if they don't have food, shelter, and their health. The work that I do with the Open ETC supports the whole of the BC post-secondary sector. And during the pandemic, it was the only platform available to several small colleges in the province to build out the supports they needed to to flip their institutions. It's highlighted the disparity in capacity and resources in the sector, and I've been able to feed that directly into the work that I've been doing as, as an external expert on the government of BC's Digital Learning Advisory Committee. The work that I do with the Perio has had global impact. Our software projects are used to support education around the world and a vibrant open source ed tech environment I think is vital for success and for access in countries where commercial options are too expensive or just a bad fit culturally. But I think the main thing that I try to be as a leader in digital education and that I encourage others to be is to be thoughtful and to be critical to learn from others, to engage widely and broadly with the field and beyond, to collaborate and to be creative. Because ultimately, I think if we do all of these things, we will be successful and we will hopefully have a lot of fun whilst doing it. Excellent. So uh, I think you can see why she was a, a winner. Um, I, 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 we all know of a few people that uh, seem to achieve an enormous amount and they're also really nice people and I think Anne-Marie is one of those people. So I don't know quite how she gets all that done. Um, and I think the other interesting thing about her work and her practice is, so there's this 
I guess there's this question that's always coming up, which is, is technology good or bad, to which the answer is yes. And you could see there from just her video that she, she's capable of holding both views. You know, obviously, there are very positive aspects to technology. There are some really sort of um, dangerous aspects that we need to keep an eye on, and she's very a active in that as well. So um, I don't know. Having been involved in ALT for, or at least coming along to ALT for years and years and years, I think we've kind of moved from... And that's come up, actually, over the conference. We've kind of moved from a, a position of sort of perhaps not quite critical enough evangelism of, of technology. And then, um, and this was in the keynote yesterday, then gradually in the last few years, there's this sort of hidden sort of data-based sort of undercurrent uh, that has... Um, grown rapidly in the background in more recent years and so we've moved from a position of evangelism perhaps to scepticism uh, and I guess the future is sort of finding a way through that and negotiating those two positions and saying look it's complex technology is ideological it's political um, we just need to be conscious of the reality of it when we're employing it in our institutions and you can see anne is obviously doing that brilliantly okay so next up is the award for teams and institutions. And as we know, that went to Glasgow. So I'll invite Glasgow, you're representing that, you're representing Glasgow, so to come and um, tell us a little bit more about your work. I'll give you a microphone. Thanks, Dave. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to do a slightly different uh, pitch from, from Wayne, where he was very focused on one thing. I'm going to sort of, uh, I'm going to take the approach as to why I put the, the team forward for the award, and um, I'm going to talk about three main areas for that, and hopefully that may encourage others to, to do the same at your, your um, local institutions. Apologies if you maybe came to a talk yesterday from my colleagues, Hannah and Craig, there'll be sort of some duplication, so I'll, I'll go relatively, relatively quick. So firstly, uh, I think it's important to uh, say a massive thank you to the shortlisting panel, the, the amount of effort um, they put in to reading all of the proposals, all of the interviews, uh, and listening to people like uh, me for half an hour present why we should win an award is, um, is a lot of work, so uh, just th thanks, for, thanks for doing that, it's often unsung uh, work. So the key areas um, that I want to focus on that was part of the submission was the commitment for upskilling the workforce. So touch a little bit about how we started that in the pandemic, but how we've really amplified that and uh, grown that in the past year. Um, about guiding the institution out of the pandemic um, sort of era um, and the benefits, more importantly, of holding on to good practice picked up and, and how we're trying to discourage away from sort of general, the areas of possible bad practice that we, that we had. And I want to just touch on about the, the pathways that we provide for students, both for um, open course content and things like MOOCs and how we're providing much more structured um, alignment with that to, to degrees. So the commitment to upskilling sort of 6,000 plus members of staff. Um, so if you were here yesterday and heard Hannah and Craig, we performed a, a college needs analysis um, for the university about a year ago. And from that, we managed to distill exactly the areas that the university on a whole were asking for support in. Uh, from that, due to the, the four college nature of the university, we've, 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 we are now able to take that a step further and go directly to colleges and say, well, you were looking for X, you were the only college for that, how can we help, how can we support that, and how can we help grow that? And what we've got here is just like the upskilling calendar. Um, so I think there's like 20 sessions, everything's sort of half hour, and they're all recorded. And the attendance ranges from, you know, maybe a couple of people right up to sort of 50 people. To give you an idea, when we started the sort of general upskilling back in the pandemic, we launched our first uh, how to use Zoom in March 2020 for staff, just as we went fully <laughs> sort of pivoted to online. We had a 500 seat Zoom license and within about three seconds, the, the counter went from zero to 500, uh, to which I <laughs> immediately started to panic. Um, and then the, the, the emails come through saying, I can't get in, it's broken. And I was like, no, we just, we've, we're, we're at max capacity. So we've continued that approach and the, um, and the university seems very positive with it. Uh, the retrospective views to these are absolutely enormous. We're, it's been about 18 months as I've checked, but we were over about 7,000 retrospective views on, on, the, um, on the sort of Zoom player. So 
the staff are going back and re-watching these again and again and again, so it's extra motivation for us to do something more with these sessions. Um, we also share and disseminate good practice, so within the institution we, we have sort of flyers that go out in digital formats and, and, and other formats as well. Um, I don't want to touch too much on the content, but what I want to say is that we've taken like a three-pronged approach to how we approach upskilling. Um, and at the bottom you'll see there's a watch, engage and attend. So we try and direct people to the resources that are already there. We try and bring them into sessions that we are running. And we are in the middle of a massive project about revamping the sort of website and taking it off actually into SharePoint. Because what we can do with things like SharePoint is if someone goes in and looks at, I want to know the basics of Camtasia, we can serve up additional content and say, well, if you're interested in Camtasia, do you know about using video and active learning? Do you know about this? And it just becomes a, a, an area that people should gravitate to naturally. But yeah, everything we do, we, we constantly share with the university and, and, and further. Uh, and to touch upon that, what we are doing is launching a 10 credit course on our PG cap called Designing Online Education, where we talk about frameworks, curriculum mapping, curriculum design. So that's, that's something that's been um, asked for during the pandemic and now we've, now we've finally got that opportunity and that starts, um, it starts in uh, two weeks. So we also share best practice with the community and we do that through um, uh, something that we use at Glasgow quite extensively which is our curriculum uh, mapping approach. And it'll be familiar if you sort of look at this, it's very similar to the ABC approach. We used that as the sort of bedrock for this. We digitised it about seven or eight years ago, um, but we've taken it a step further now. We've actually managed to map it onto a, a Word document. It's, that sounds easy, it actually was very difficult to do that. Um, so now that will be on the website very soon and we encourage everyone to take and use it. And I know people over the past sort of five or six years have actually done that. And it's Creative Commons license, so we obviously reference the UCL framework. Um, but this on the website is available and, and, and sort of guidance and, and how to use it. And like I said, we use this, we use this extensively for our MOOCs, micro credentials and even online degrees um, and we map this out. Um, we, we help people, colleagues, map a, a course out or a, or a degree out. I guess the sort of advocate for sharing is sessions like today and it's important to, I think, always come up and say things that have worked but equally share things that haven't worked. I think that's, I sometimes feel you come to a conference and it's like, you know, everyone's got such success stories, we have other stories. So I think it's important that we share bo both sides of, of the coin. Um, and, and yeah, I think the, the, the information sort of on the left there is we've mapped out micro-credentials, we've looked at it how it's mapped out as a process from a standard course being developed at a university and how a micro-credential, especially with an external supplier, the additional steps and rigour that it has to go through. So we've done a lot of that, so if you are going down that process, just reach out and we're, we'll share everything with you. Nothing's, nothing's sensitive in that way. Um, and finally, uh, we spend a huge amount of time providing pathways for learners onto different degree programmes. And it's not just about bringing students into degree programmes, it's about having different entry points to, to education. So we have fantastic courses on uh, Future Learning Coursera, and that's just a, a snapshot of, of two that's launched recently. I think this is the most important thing, it's about trying to connect this ecosystem for learners so they can start with a MOOC, work their way through that, that ecosystem and end up potentially at an online degree. But not every student wants to do an online degree, so we provide multiple entry points for learners to, to gain knowledge, new information. Um, and learners actually tell us just how good it is if they've taken a MOOC and worked their way through this sort of system. They, they feel supported, they feel it was the right decision, it was informed decision making. Um, so we, we advocate this for a lot of our uh, online offerings. Um, and the university engages in this process very, very successfully. Um, I think Craig mentioned it uh, well yesterday in his talk. At the beginning, we used to go to colleagues. Now it's, it's very much a colleagues coming to us for this, which is fantastic. Um, and I'm just going to leave uh, my last slide with a quote from our uh, Vice Principal for Learning and Teaching, just about how the LISUs became sort of integral to the university. So I think that's just a really good statement. And I think for the team, um, 
I just, you know, congratulations to everyone in the unit. We've got two here, but there's, there's, there's more back at Glasgow. So just congratulations to everyone. Brilliant. Thank you. Before, before you run away, I've got, I've got a question for you. So I think what you can see there is, I, you know, this is one of the reasons why you're a, win why, why you're a winner, why Glasgow is uh, you're across a lot. Yes. Right? So it seems, so, you know, I've, I've been involved in similar teams for, for years and uh, I don't think I've ever managed to be across that many different things. So here's my question. Yep. Okay. If you were the head of your, I can't remember Scotland, it's not a VC, is it? Is it president? What's the, who's the boss man in your place? Boss person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the, um, that's the uh, chancellor and then we've got like vice principals for different disciplines. Okay, so there's, there's a super important person in your organisation, right? If you were that person, right, what would you, uh, what would you do for your team like, what's the area that you really think is gonna could have the biggest impact if yeah. only you had a little bit more? I don't know, focus, support, yeah. money. What would you really, really want to push on? Um, so, what has massively helped us was the uh, new learning and teaching strategy. Okay. So we weren't referenced in it, but a lot of our activity and the pillars that support the learning and teaching strategy were there, yeah. um, and it's. It's very easy to look at that strategy and you understand who in the organisation can help get you there. Um, so the strategy that was released at the beginning of this year has had a massive impact on, on the unit and the colleagues that come to us for support. So if you are coming to a point where the learning and teaching strategy has been revised, maybe possible every five years, absolutely speak to those people and say, we can help with that, but we need sort of some references that point people to us organically without being called out as a, as a unit in the strategy. That won't happen. But you need to be um, the enabler of that strategy. Uh, so that's the most important thing that's helped us, especially uh, this year, to get involved in across all the different things that we've been doing. But the pandemic massively helped us. Let's not forget yeah, that yeah. because we, we were amplified overnight and. Um, so yeah, but the, from, from this point on, it's more strategy-led, it's definitely been a big enabler. Okay, excellent, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, yeah, that's really interesting. So kind of getting wired in as a really authentic part of the organization so everybody knows who you are. And I think your experience at Glasgow is probably similar to a lot of our experience here, which is um, that we've moved from uh, having to kind of I don't know, sell our wares around the university to having so many people coming towards us that it's a whole different way of working. So now it's strategizing around the fact that you're suddenly super popular rather than trying to figure out how to get people to engage with you. And it's, it's, it's almost turned upside down from, from the pandemic, hasn't it? So fantastic. Deserved winners. Thanks for that. Okay, so moving on. Award for case studies of ethical ed tech. So uh, I think because... Probably most people have seen the video for this, haven't they? Um, so what I was going to do was just talk around it a little bit and ask you guys a question that we can, we can use VBOX for, actually. Um, so one of the interesting things about this form, and if you want to watch the video, which has got a lot of detail in it, then it will be on the website, won't it? Uh, but just in case you weren't here for the awards, um, Falmouth uh, had developed the Dunn, uh, quite a detailed piece of research into what the carbon cost of uh, online events, and I guess online teaching, because online teaching is a form of online event, what that carbon cost is compared with face-to-face -face events. And one of the things that floats past very quickly in the video that you might not spot is, I think at one point um, she says that the carbon footprint for all of the online events they'd done over quite a long period of time that had two and a half thousand people participate in them, that carbon footprint was the same as one one hour face to face event for a hundred people. So like this, okay, which I think is pretty huge. And one of the things that's interested me over the pandemic, but I think it was there before, and I don't, I, you know, I don't know what your experience of this is, 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 is there's a thing that I think of as, as kind of hyper scrutiny which is that because the digital is still so in some ways perhaps strategically seen as a, a new thing by institutions, uh, it quite often comes under, as a mode, it quite un often comes under more scrutiny 
than the bit of the university that people consider to be, the, the bit of the university that they're culturally normalised to, which tends to be the residential bit, depending on what kind of institution you come from. So um, things around um, perhaps sustainability, um, certainly um, inclusion, uh, uh, accessibility, they're really, really heavily scrutinised with the, whenever it's to do with digital education, which is as it should be. But I've got this little test that I run in my own mind, which is if somebody says, ah, you're doing, you're doing that online, you're doing that teaching and learning online, have you considered blah, 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 and then something to do with inclusion or something to do with sustainability or something to do with time zones? And, I, and I, I'll just cross-check in my mind whether that's something that anybody's really considering when it comes to the residential courses or not. And often they are, but quite often to a lesser extent. So I do think it's reasonable to occasionally go, yes, we have considered that. Uh, we consider it at least as much, if not more, than the other modes in the university. And it's not a fight between digital and, and residential or digital and analogue modes, but I think it's worth... Um, being a little bit careful about that and sort of pointing it out if it comes up in as constructive a way as possible. So in terms of this and, and this piece of work, um, which I think was a really brilliant winner for Ethical EdTech, uh, I just wanted to ask you guys a question that you can answer using this, which is or most of our institutions, I, I, I suspect all of our institutions will have got, will be signed up to some kind of sustainability you know, framework or and targets and all the rest of it. I need to phrase this question so that it's, it's a yes, no. I'm going to create a pickle if I'm not careful. Um, I'm going to create a pickle. Uh, it's, does your institution have any... Wait, hang on there a second, guys. <laughs> I'm just about to plough into the problem there. Uh, does your institution have... Any specific framework for digital sustainability, to your knowledge, yes or no? And you can answer here. It'll just come. It'll just come up. Should it might be better as a yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you want to mention quiche, that's fine too. We just. Oh, so slick, guys. Well done. All right. You can answer again. It's quite exciting, isn't it? Okay, so that's kind of twitching around about the around about. I think that's going to. Ooh. That's a, that's around about where it's going to end up. So it's about it's going to be about three quarters no. Oh, it's, oh, oh, I should just wait. Yeah, it's around about three quarters no. Um, one quarter of maths. One quarter yes, which is which is intriguing. Um, now, I, I, I suspect that's probably because, obviously, in terms of sustainability and carbon, the, the, the sort of bit, the physical estate and the residential programs are just, you know, obviously, that, as we can see from the work of Falmouth, that, that's a much bigger footprint than digital. But I think, as I mentioned on the awards evening, pretty soon we're going to have to come up with a kind of what, what's the carbon cost for an online student? What's the carbon cost for a... For a um, a residential student, an international student, a home student, and, and be able to add this stuff up. Because we do have to take responsibility for the fact that obviously digital has a carbon footprint and Falmouth, not only did they come up with the numbers, but they developed a method of running digital events that minimised the carbon footprint of those events. So there are ways of doing it well or badly digitally. So I've got one more question. Can I have another word cloud, please? I'm loving this. Uh, so another yes, no word cloud, which is the same question but uh, around um, sort of the residential, the buildings. Do you have in your institution some kind of sustainability carbon type framework for the physical estate, for everything else, yes or no? So I've, I've sort of lent on VVOX a little bit here, but we'll see if they can generate another word cloud. Clearly I've just sprung this on them. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Kerry's just reminded me that, that Cara, who um, did the work at Falmouth, was a PhD student, and it was a PhD study, which is one of the reasons why it's so detailed. Thank you. Yes. 
And I believe, Wayne, that was the same for you, wasn't it? You were, it was your, yeah. So in terms of, you know, um, digital education and, uh, you know, uh, research and how that relates to practice, there's two really good examples of serious piece of research that's ended up being one of the award winners. Okay, so that's just flipped that on its head. Well, that worked out well for me. So, <laughs> so, you, so I, I probably just undercut my statement about hyper-scrutiny on the digital, haven't I, if I think about it, because in actual fact, it, it goes the other way. So, just to sort of finish, thank you for doing that, and thanks, Feedbox, that was super agile, love it. Okay, um, I, just to finish that up, I think um, it's... It's a good example of where the, the winner of the Alt Award is, is probably like a couple of years ahead of the curve because our institutions haven't quite caught up yet. But I think in, in two or three years' time, if I ask the same question, then whatever sustainability thing we were, our institutions are signed up for would now include the digital. That's, what, that's where I imagine that might head. Okay, thank you. Yes, and... This is, this is great, I'm loving this. Uh, they're gonna, uh, Falmouth will be sharing that um, work that they've done openly, as I mentioned, on, on the awards night. So we could probably bring that into our institutions as a way of kind of pushing that area forward. Okay, so next up is bing, digital transformation. So I'd like to invite the guys from Leeds up. Tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you. <clears throat> Morning, everyone. Um, so Steve and I are just going to talk to you briefly about the Minerva Upgrade Project at the University of Leeds. Um, it's a, it was a huge and very complex project, so we're going to focus on a particular aspect, which is the um, online teaching areas. But before we get into that, I would just like to say thanks um, to Alt for recognising the hard work of the team. It, as I say, it was, a, it was a huge and really complex pro, uh, project. And the team worked incredibly hard under very difficult circumstances. So um, I'd like to say thanks to the team. Um, Debbie is here re um, representing the team somewhere. Um, and also to the um, other people at Leeds who supported us, in particular the faculty-based learning technologists, um, of whom we have many. So um, if you will indulge me, fe uh, fellow delegates, and just give a brief round of applause to these people as they're in the audience. That would be lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, as I say, the project was enormous, so we're really just going to talk this morning about one particular aspect, and that is the, um, the online teaching space kind of upgrade. Um, if you do want to learn, know more about such things as our mass communication strategy, um, and you've got spare seven to eight hours, uh, please call me outside afterwards. Um, but yeah, so anyway, moving on. So um, the project really has a, a, an enormously long history. Um, back in 2017, so which is you know the before times, um, uh, we created what we call Minerva. What we did was we brought together our Blackboard VLE and a separate portal. And I was involved in that project, it was really good, but what it did do was highlight some of the problems that we had at Leeds, uh, particularly with our sort of physical infrastructure. We were running Minerva on a um, really old, um, hardware based at the institution, uh, but we're relying on a whole load of custom pieces of code, widgets, things like that. So obviously customization is great, but what it does do is potentially give you problems when, for instance, people leave the institution, um, people are around. So um, thankfully, the timing worked out well for us in that before the pandemic happened, we experienced a lot of periods of downtime. Um, I think the worst period of downtime was like two days, which obviously don't really want your main uh, learning and teaching system being down for, for two days. Um, so it's decided that we really needed to sort this out and um, the Minerva project was instigated and one of the first things that we wanted to do was move off that old piece of hardware on uh, campus and move to software as a service delivery. Thankfully, we were able to do um, the first phase of that before the pandemic hit. I'm not saying that we knew what was happening, but uh, let's just put it down to look. Um, and then in summer 2021, we actually moved all the way to SAS. So we moved first to managed hosting, and then we moved all the way to SAS. Um, next slide, please. I always wanted to say that. Um, so 
as part of that move, we were then able to look at um, Blackboard's new Ultra Course fee, which was a, a new design that they had for teaching areas. Um, we'd been Blackboard customers since 2008, and we'd been using their original course design basically out of the box since then. So an awfully long time, really. And there were an all, there were loads of problems with that um, with that view that had accrued over the years. So um, really kind of. Uh, labyrinthine module structures. Um, I used to work in um, uh, the Minerva support team and um, I remember one call that I got where a student was panicking because they had an assessment to hand in, they couldn't find the assessment point. It took me half an hour to find it. So we really wanted to get away from that. And we looked at Ultra Cars for you and we thought that while it was still, um, it was in development, but we felt that it, it provided us with um, the potential that we could have something better. So we investigated it. We felt it had a more modern interface. It was, um, it's a lot more accessible, um, works well on mobile devices, um, gets updated monthly. Um, we used to have a, an annual update, so we would be on the same system for sometimes up to 18 months, but Ultra has um, monthly updates adding features. Um, and we decided to instigate a pilot. Um, and that pilot went pretty well. Um, so these are some quotes from from uh, from students. Um, you'll see the the one on the the on what would be your left hand side. Um, no, your right hand side. Sorry, <laughs> one or the other. Fifty fifty, and I got it wrong. That one. That's right. Um, does highlight a, a key problem that we found, and I'm sure that you are familiar with this too. Which is students said that um, while they liked it, um, they were less keen on the fact that some academics created module structures that look like this and some create ones that look like this. So, and that was, that was something that we've, we've seen in feedback for many, many years. So when we, want, when we decided to actually roll out Ultra Course for you, we felt that firstly we wanted to go with a big bang approach and have all our modules use it so that we weren't giving some students uh, one experience and others a different one. Um, and we also knew that we needed to really look at that consistency, that sort of consistent approach. So we worked with some uh, colleagues at the institution, we with pretty much every colleague at the institution really. Um, so various projects that we've got going on, um, one of which is Curriculum Redefined. Um, our faculty learning technologists, who I mentioned before, um, our DEALS, we love, a, we love an acronym at Leeds, it's a Digital Education Academic Lead. Um, and we uh, came to, the recognize, uh, the, we came to decide that what we really needed was a module structure, so a sort of suggested scaffold for teaching content. And what we wanted was something that could be used across the institution. Leeds is a, obviously a very big institution. We, we deal with a, a wide range of disciplines. So we needed something that would work for everyone. Um, and we wanted to provide a level of flexibility within that so that um, colleagues in design, colleagues in medicine health could make it work for them. Um, and Steve's going to talk to you a bit more about the template. Brilliant. Um, hello everybody and uh, thank you very much for having us. Uh, just to start off with, we don't have um, a uniform in the Minerva project of plaid shirts <laughs> and we certainly didn't coordinate this morning but uh, you know, these things happen. Um, just to explain who I am, uh, my name's Steve. I'm actually on my day job a lecturer in the university. So I specialise in the financial crime and digital sphere. So if you've ever had an email from a Nigerian prince, that sort of thing, that's what I look into. But for the last two years, I have been part seconded to our digital education services team to act as what's called the academic lead for this project. Basically, I look after the, the governance structure, but also um, I am what's probably described as the chief advocate, cheerleader, um, complaints line for the academic side and the engagement with this project because one of the things we, uh, we thought about when we started on this project is that whilst and I'm sure most people in this room know this I'm teaching a few to suck eggs here um, if technology can improve that's great but actually it's the engagement with the institution and with the staff is just as important as the technology itself you can bring a new piece of technology it's fantastic whiz bang it works and you haven't got the institution with you on that journey uh, on this large-scale institutional change you're gonna really struggle so um, what we thought about with this project when we um, started was that we needed this kind of interaction between Paul and the team and the, the, the academic side of things. So we went away and, and we spoke to a lot of uh, our institutional stakeholders. 
and we said, okay, what are you interested in? What are you actually looking for when we come through this? And we created our institutional module template from that. And it ran within our pilot, within one of my own modules, and, and 50, I always get the number wrong, 54? 52. 52, I'd say I always get the number wrong. 54 modules uh, from January and second semester this uh, year. And this created this sort of standardised structure which we knew our students were interested in and wanted uh, because of, as we said, from the feedback from the pilot itself. And it allowed our staff to revisit their teaching areas and to go back and have a look at their content. Because as we know, um, we've had a pretty difficult couple of years. Uh, and it's very difficult to, get, to motivate staff to go back and look at all the content and say, well, can you change it up? Can you mix things up? And realistically, we've, we've all been in an emergency mode for a couple of years. But this template has allowed us to go back and do that. And it has given us that kind of a, a boost, as it were. So if we can pop up that, okay. Uh, but really what I wanted to kind of have a bit of a chat about and to talk for the remainder three or four minutes is, is how we did implement this, how we engage with the institution, how we, how we actually uh, aligned what we're doing with at least support or hope for support. Uh, and so we start off with our communication strategy. So we went out to the institution and we started in 2000, uh, 2021. So around about 12 months before we brought in some of these big changes. We started off with the usual town hall meetings, going in, listening to staff, listening to the, the complaints more than anything else, the struggles that people are going through, because people want to be heard. People want to feel like they're going on this journey with you, and it's not just being imposed on them. Um, yeah, and then uh, this, this kind of culminated in the release of our Ultra Course View modules this year. And, and in June this year, we had around about 8,500 modules all moving across to this new platform which, uh, I'll be brutally honest, was extremely daunting, terrifying, and we expected to have this plethora uh, of emails and complaints coming through, and, and quite frankly, it hasn't happened yet. Now, I'm fully aware we're still two, two weeks away from the start of term, and most academics, like myself, probably haven't even looked at their content at this point yet, and we'll probably get it in a few weeks' time. But realistically, it, it seems to have gone well. Can I ask you to pop over to the next one? And it's gone well because we've tried to do a bit of a belts and braces approach with our communications and support. Uh, we tried to include both digital and in-person support. So we started off with this high-level overview package of what change is coming. This was done by the DES team. It's absolutely brilliant. And if you get a chance, feel free to go and have a look at it. And then we started to implement and identify that we do have these really great resources at a school and faculty level, in particular our LTs and our deals. Again, acronyms, apologies. Um, and what we did, we put a suite of training on for them as train the trainer training. Lots of alliteration, my apologies. Uh, and, and this was for them to get up to speed before we then went out to the rest of the institution. Anything you want to say on that, Paul, before I kind of move on? Um, no, just, yeah, as, as Steve said. You're, you're going to have to go relatively yes. quickly. <laughs> I told you we were going to walk. <laughs> yeah, we're on the last slide. Don't worry, guys. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it just, it's, as Steve said, it really was a kind of um, mix of in-person, well, in virtual in-person, so asynchronous and asynchronous. And we worked really hard to um, ensure that the kind of learning styles of, of everyone were catered for. So um, whether it's on-demand sessions, whether it's coming to a, an actual session, whether it's looking at a website, looking at a high-level overview. Um, with training sessions that we ran um, and drop-in sessions and also through the work of our faculty learning techs and deals like actually embedded within our faculties and schools being there to support staff if they have any problems. Oh, thank you. Excellent. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, I mean, just a personal reflection from me, you know, there's, I've been involved in those kind of projects as have many people here and I think everybody here knows just how huge and tricky and kind of terrifying that project is. I mean, you know, trying to move, transform from a VLE that you haven't sort of touched since 2008, and you use the term Big Bang, which pretty much everybody else would go, we can't do it as a Big Bang, yeah. but you just did anyway, yeah. uh, it's pretty huge. I think one of the reasons why uh, I think Leeds is a great winner is that, you, is that you started with a technology platform, you finished with sort of the same platform, haven't you? That's not the point. The, the transformation was everything except for the platform yes, in some senses, right, which I think is a really important emphasis um, and the reason why Alton Jess really thought that you were really strong winners. Okay, we don't really have time for questions, but there, there is one up there, and I think the answer is yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> the answer is yes. So we can, you can get, I mean, you can, you, you, can, you can track down these guys and go, how the hell did you manage to do that? 
because uh, you'll be floating around for a little bit for the rest of the day. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Okay, so, so we've managed to run that to time somehow. Fantastic. I think we've got a half an hour break now. Next sessions are at half ten. If you're interested in watching the videos, then Marin's posted that link onto Discord so you can take a look at them as well. Thanks. Cheers.